I just have a couple little things um, that I thought I would share with you and then we could do some Q and A. You can stop me and interrupt me at any time and you know, you can pop things in the chat or whatever and that'll be good. Sound like a plan? Okay, cool. Sounds great. So um, here is how you get a hold of me. And uh, I'm at andrea-zellner.com and then at Andrea Zellner on Twitter. And then my email is alzellner at gmail. So you can always email me questions if you have them and they don't get answered tonight. And as we were joking around before, I am a PhD in educational psychology and educational technology. And I focus my research on motivation in online spaces. And I've been teaching uh, online. I started teaching as a high school teacher in an online space in 2004. And I've been teaching ever since online in some way, shape or form, whether it's professional learning for teachers or when I was teaching at Michigan State University in their masters of ed tech and in their PhD programs, I've done a lot of work in online spaces and uh, it's really fun for me. So I have a lot of questions and curiosities about how it works out for everybody when we're moving to distance learning or remote learning or online learning, however we want to define those things. And it's really one of my passions. So I can really go off on this topic, which is probably why they asked me to do it. So uh, I thought we would start with where we are currently here in Michigan, because people have a ton of questions about it. And my day job is supporting schools and districts um, in our county and around our state. And as a result, I spent a lot of time with the executive order that came out 2020-35, which closed our schools for the rest of the school year. And in that executive order, Governor Whitmer insisted on remote learning. And as part of that remote learning, each district is required to submit a plan to their local intermediate school district. So for us in Oakland County, that would be Oakland schools. And that plan needs approval and it has to have 14 different aspects to that plan. And part of that includes communication with parents, uh, a good faith effort to make sure that all kids are receiving adequate instruction and also a focus even on mental health. And the focus is also on putting students first. And so those were some pieces of the executive order that came down. And so that's really where most of the districts are right now. They're trying to get their plans in and they're due by April 28th. So most of the online or remote learning will happen then. The guidance from the state was that it could be sort of three levels of remote learning the lowest uh, tech level is kind of packets. Um, so districts are sending out packets and they're trying to get books in the hands of kids uh, so that they can overcome the very real problem that we have, which is a huge digital divide in our state. So there are places even in Oakland County that even if you were to give them a mobile hotspot to get on the internet, that kids couldn't even get on the internet because it's just, there aren't cell towers nearby, there's no infrastructure for getting online. So schools have to consider that in their plans. The next kind of tier or whatever uh, is mixed. So like some kids might get packets and books and, and then some of it might be online and by, you know, kind of all mixed together depending on what kids need. And then some districts like West Bloomfield are going to fully online. Um, they had their plan in place from day one. They didn't do any enrichment. They really focused on instruction uh, from the original executive order when we thought it was just gonna be three weeks. So there's a real different ways that people are going about solving this problem that we all have to be instructed at a distance. So that's the executive order. It's pretty exciting stuff. So right now they're in the develop the plan kind of phase. Some of them are moving into developing the teachers. Most teachers have no idea how to do this. We're trained to be with our students face to face in front of us. Um, this is a very different skill set for all of our teachers. I worked for a while as a tech coach while I was finishing up my doctorate. And 
the the range of experiences that teachers might have might be all the way from like, here's how you attach something on an email all the way to fully understanding how to use video conferencing services um they're all learning now all at once so that's a lot of pressure and in addition most of our teachers are also teaching kids or have their own students and kids at home that they're trying to manage all of that for um, so that's a real big lift for all of us. So all of us parents who have kids at home, I have two sixth graders and twin boys and they're wild and <laughs> trying to work my day job while they're trying to manage their online learning is a lot. And then as a result of all of that, we're supposed to all be monitoring each other's progress. So like, how are the teachers doing? How are the kids doing um, and all of that? Uh, so it's a, it's a huge shift for everyone in these systems and it's incredibly stressful and difficult. So that's a really tough reality to be living in. So one of the things when I tell, talk to people about technology, whenever we're using technology, it's going to amplify whatever was going on before. So that means that if there's sort of like pedagogy that maybe isn't so student-centered and is more lecture-based and isn't is really the highest level of pedagogical uh, ideas that we want teachers to have it like really strong teaching that we want kids to have uh, it's going to amplify some of that not so hot stuff that's going on but if you have a great teacher that's going to get amplified too and you're seeing a lot of that all these teachers who are like teaching math through the storm door <laughs> to their students or calling or creating these beautiful videos for their students technology is going to amplify whatever is going on so if you're you're going to see a real range um because for the first time teaching has become very 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 public in a way that it's never been before so that's going on too so some consensus about online learning, because I think a lot of people are sort of thinking about online learning as being the answer to this idea of providing remote learning. Um, synchronous opportunities are always better for the learner than asynchronous. So uh, think about it as the difference between like a set of emails that go back and forth as opposed to something like this. For most of us, we would rather be in something like this than a bunch of emails going back and forth because it's more interesting, it's more fun, we can interact with each other. And we find that to hold true. Like there's people have taught different um, versions of the same course with different levels of synchronicity. And especially it's about the peers talking to each other. So the most impactful stuff we can do with students and learners is to have us talk to each other. Um, the other thing is that online teaching, when you're planning for online teaching, it takes a lot more time. So that's something that I lived myself in many different iterations. I would much rather teach face-to-face -face because it takes less time. There's, so, there's a lot more you have to plan for when you move online. The other thing that people think about sometimes when they're thinking about remote learning is returning to systems like Khan Academy, for example, that uses lots of digital badges. IXL uses badges. There's lots of these different online systems that use digital badges as a reward system or might reward kids with games if they persist in their work through this system. Um, but we find that that has a negative impact on motivation. And so that's something to be cautious about and like thinking about as we're all moving into this. And then the other thing is that online learning often exacerbates inequity and inequality. Uh, so they found this in study after study with online charter schools and that really, um, I think one of the most interesting findings is when teachers think that parents are going to facilitate the learning at home, the outcomes for students are worse. There's something about that mental shift of thinking there's a parent around to help um, that decreases the quality of instruction. So we've noticed that in some of the in some of the research. And then the other thing that's in the middle of all this is the impact of trauma. So we have kids right now in our county whose whole family and all their caretakers have been hospitalized or are dying. Uh, the teachers themselves are sick or caring for people who are sick or have lost their own family members. And so not only are we doing this really hard thing 
and all of our lives are disrupted, we're all traumatized. And uh, that is also in this mix as well, which is partially why the executive order really emphasize mental health services for everyone because this is a traumatizing time and uh, for all of us in the system we're seeing the really horrific impacts of COVID um, on these families and and it will touch all of us and so that's in in here as well. So I'm going to leave it there for now and then um, I thought I would take some questions um, I saved a couple other slides in case those questions come up, but I'll just open it up. That was my big fire hose of all the information about um, what we're currently doing. Hi, this is Max. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Max. Go ahead. Hi. Okay. So I guess my question is, you know, we have obviously three kids here at home that are um, going to be doing the online learning. We're in the Troy School District. And well, it just so happened that they did a little bit of online learning at the beginning, and then we went to what was to have been their spring break. Mm -hmm. And so they had to week off, and then we got a notification from the school district rep that they needed one more week to kind of get everything in order. So they're just kind of beginning the online learning process. And one concern that I have really isn't a concern so much with the teachers or the technology. The concern that I have is about motivation for my own mm -hmm. kids I mean right now with everybody's schedule being so off I mean they're sleeping in until like noon they're just like you know on their screens and trying to connect with their friends and it's like before they were in various stages of motivation where they were very driven and they did their stuff and they went to their marching band and their boy scouts and all these like mm -hmm. uh oh you froze for we me restart the motivation piece of it because like in order the teachers can do a perfect job that the technology can work perfect but if they're not motivated and if they're just like distracted and worried about everything that's going on like how do we get that part fixed yeah how old are your, all your kids uh 18 16 and 13. okay so you have the really hard problem of also having adolescents in the mix of this and i think that's the most impactful on our on our adolescents like mine are not quite into like being with their friends all the time because they're a little they're 12 um but your 13 i'm sure your 16 and your 18 year old are having the hardest time uh with all of yeah, this well, 18 year old senior so would have had the homecoming the prom graduation i mean yeah. it's canceled Everything's canceled it's really a huge heartbreak so i think I won't worry too much that they're sleeping in because honestly, if I were a teenager, like it's exactly <laughs> what I would do. But one of the things that um, I always joke around, like there's a reason preschool teachers have, they're so locked into their schedules. And we were kind of joking around beforehand about how we've made schedules for our kids. It isn't the end of the world to maybe sit down and like have a family meeting with everyone and say, listen, like, things are getting real now <laughs> because there's credit involved. You have to pass. Like we've got to get something better that's more workable for everyone in our family. And now that things are going to change and get kind of serious, could we start at a certain time? So I don't know, like my family are really, they, my kids really love the schedule. So I was joking around before it, like we have a morning meeting and someone does the weather and we say the Pledge of Allegiance, like, the kids have really worked, we've decided together collectively what that will look like. Um, and we have sort of brain breaks too and throughout the day. So I'll, tr I'll look at my meeting schedule for the day and figure out when I have like five minutes where I can throw on a little quick, like there's something called go noodle and there's all these little quick workout things. And we just do a quick run around and get crazy because it's been so cold. And then we go back to work and that works for adults and for kids because I've done that with all the way through adults where we do little brain breaks like that. I think the key is, is to sort of say like, you know, 10 to 11 is English and a lot. then we take a five minute or a 15 minute break you can talk to your friends, however it is, building in screen free time for them too and really forcing them to be bored is one of those things that we can do for them that's kind of a gift because a lot of times we're not used to being bored in today's day and age. Um, so build in a little bit of screen free breaks so they can have that. Make sure that you know you're talking to them about like when does it make sense for you to talk to your friends 
you know, when are you working the best? Because one of the affordances of being online is it can actually follow the natural rhythms of a teenager's life, which means they can sleep later and work later. There's nothing wrong with that. It might, might be healthier for them. Um, but then, of course, are you shutting down at a good and early enough time to get some sleep? And so I think just having that conversation with them and say, like, here's the problem that we have. How do we as a family solve this since we're all together in isolation? We need to have some way to manage all of this and put it on them. And it'll give them a lot of autonomy and it'll be good for them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? You know, I think also while we're talking about adolescence and like how long and motivation and stuff, the Michigan documentation, I know that, um, I don't know, let me show my screen again. The Michigan documentation is a little bit different than I saw the Illinois documentation going around their state put things out. Here's our Michigan documentation about how long the minimums and maximums for how much time things should be happening. Um, so you can see that uh, for the little guys, they got like three or five minutes. You don't have long. Um, and as they get older, these continue higher. So if you're looking at, you know, third, fourth, and fifth graders, they're really only doing two hours total of time a day on the screen or in their schoolwork because it's, it, it's too much to ask of little kids to be that self-directed for that amount of time. Um, so you can see the minimum is about an hour and a maximum is about two hours. Uh, for as they get older, you can see that this increases. So even when you get to high school, we're trying to keep it at around 210 minutes a day uh, for those kids that be, this is not the equivalent of being face to face. And the reason for that is that when you think about a school day, you've got passing time, you've got lunch, you've got if you have uh, 55 minute classes, which is the norm in our county, you've got to come in, get everybody to sit down, have them shift um, from, I was just in math class, now I have to think like a historian. <laughs> now I have to think like a lit major, like you're bouncing from class to class and that takes cognitive shifting and time in your brain. So really when you distill down the very essence of the learning for that day, it's probably 10 or 15 minutes and the rest is practice or socialization or just classroom procedures. And so when we're moving online, it looks a lot different because it's just the pure essence of what you might have learned that day. There's a lot of time that is in a school day that is about transitioning kids from one thing to the next. And anyone who's had to get their toddler out the door to put their shoes on or even their high schooler out the door <laughs> to something knows that transitions are hard for everyone and now we don't have to worry about them so much because we're all just at home and so um just like i know for me i don't have a commute anymore and that's really changed how much time i have to like do yoga in the morning or whatever uh the same is true for our kids so this these are the guidelines for our for our older kids and our younger kids for the state of Michigan. And that is also to address motivation. Uh, this is Larry. Can you hear me, Andrea? I can hear you, Larry. Hi. Hi. I was uh, muted there for a while. Um, I wondered if the uh, Whitmer's Executive Order 2020-35 requires that schools to provide food for children. It does. And it it prov you have to provide food, yep. And I wondered if you could talk about uh, how difficult it is to learn if you're hungry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so part of the executive order does provide for food. You have to have food delivery. So the different um, school districts are handling that in different ways, and they're partnering with community organizations to make sure that food gets out to those kids. But of course, we are always worrying about the ones we don't hear from. Because if we don't know, we don't know. And that is the thing that keeps all the educators I know up at night. I know I worry about it constantly because there are many, many students in Oakland County who rely on school not only for lunch, but for breakfast as well. Uh, so the community programs have been seeing pretty 
good. Um, I would say like they're seeing more than they usually see than in the summer meetups and eat up. Uh, but they're trying, you know, trying to work with churches and other community organizations to make sure that, that the word gets out. I also know that some of the districts have been using the bus routes to make sure that food gets out. So they've been using that to deliver food or Chromebooks or mobile hotspots. They're actually driving the bus routes in a bus and, and getting that stuff out. So that's happening to varying degrees and uh, with various amounts of frequency around the county. Um, but yeah, if it, I... I, there are so many kids who rely on our schools for much, much more than even food. Maybe that's their only safe place. And that really, that definitely worries me. Um, well, on Andrea, a basis. Uh, I don't see how <clears throat> the state Bonnie, can determine. I was determined. Can you hear me? Lost the yep, go ahead, Larry. <laughs> I, I was uh, wondering if, uh, how the school could possibly determine if uh, a child was hungry and whether the parents are actually getting food for, for them. Uh, yeah. Even if yeah. it's free. Right, so what a lot of schools do with high levels of poverty is they don't distinguish between who is free and reduced lunch and who isn't. So the food is provided freely to <clears throat> who, whomever is um, available uh, you to have take to, it. Uh, you have to pick up the food, so. Uh, how does the state know that people are picking up the food and giving it to their children? Uh, the only way, only what we, the only thing that we can do is um, make sure that they have um, the opportunity to come pick it up. And then the counselors are generally trying to make contact with those kids that they know are in poverty or may have free and reduced lunch because they were, you know, had applied for that. Um, and then again, it's like the community outreach to say like, here, come and eat. But yeah, there are kids that we know are going to fall through the cracks. Well, can, can the teacher uh, talk to the students and ask them if they're hungry? Yeah, so that's a lot of the teachers are doing that. They're checking in with their kids, they're calling. Um, there's some guidance around how often kids should be made contact with. So some, there's some other regulations around students with IEPs, students with special needs, um, students who have accommodations that they are required to touch, the, touch base with those kids and those families. So I, I know that every school district, I can say with, with total confidence, are working very, very hard to track down all of those kids. But we also know from other natural disasters like Hurricane Katrina, um, other different uh, research on systems that are impacted and have to close like in a, a time of tragedy or whatever, that some families fall through the cracks and it's our most um, vulnerable families. It sounds like there's no way for the teacher to see the children uh, online. They can't, it depends on if they have the infrastructure to do that. So, it, you know, there's so many things that have to be in place first. So. Do they have access to internet? Do, is the infrastructure even available in that part of the county? Because as I was saying before, some parts of the county don't have cell towers or reliable internet. Um, and so then it's, how are they gonna get eyes on that kid? And so people have done that in various ways. So some of the teachers have been like driving past the, the the houses, they drive the bus routes to try and wave at the kids. But we also have school of choice in Michigan, which means some kids are not bused. And so their parents are driving them. And um, research on school of choice has shown um, that kids who avail themselves, families that avail themselves of that are often highly mobile on top of it. And so we tend to um, not do a great job of tracking those families down um, after they leave and whatnot. So that's uh, an area of need in terms of the one, system. One last thing, <clears throat> one last yeah. question. Uh, mm -hmm. Can, could the Zoom, Zoom uh, conferencing be part of this program? Yeah, so, so there- So the teacher could see the children? Yeah, so teachers are using a couple different services, including Zoom. Uh, they're using Google Meet and other web conferencing, um, but, you know, one of the things is that some kids may not want to be on webcam because they're embarrassed about what their house looks like. 
Um, maybe they don't have a, a device that can support the use of web conferencing. So maybe they, you know, it's a phone call instead. Um, and so the, uh, and the final thing that for me personally is that uh, I feel like there's some privacy problems with Zoom and these other options while it affords us being able to look at each other uh, you're also now teaching in people's homes. And one of the concerns that I personally have is now I'm a teacher and I can see into my students' home. Now I have, I can see if they're in trauma. I can see if they're being abused. And a lot of teachers are not ready or prepared to handle what they might be seeing in students' homes. And so that's a huge concern for me too. Uh -huh. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I have a question. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, my grandson mm -hmm. is pretty smart, but he's gotten into a very lazy uh, demeanor right now. <laughs> and we've been talking about, you know, he's been meeting with a counselor and all he thinks about is wanting to play basketball in college, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so me and my daughter, we've been talking about maybe giving him money for each, like 50 bucks for every A and, and 25 bucks for every B, you know, uh, to give him some incentive. He's really likes money a lot. He likes <laughs> tennis shoes a lot. So what do you think of that idea? Is that a... So a lot of people do that idea. This, this is one that's been around a long time. So there's two things kind of going on here. I personally understand grades to be their own form of currency. And it just means that some kids enjoy that currency and some kids do not they're not motivated by that currency. Um, so back at the beginning of all this hour, I was mentioning that rewards end up decreasing intrinsic motivation. This is very huge research thread in educational psychology. It dates back 40 years or more. Uh, one of my favorite studies looked at kids with uh, coloring and they told the kids that they would get you know, money or candy or whatever, little toys, uh, if they colored. And then they found later that kids who were rewarded were less likely to pick up coloring as their preferred activity. And this bears out across activities. It bears out in reading, which is why you don't want to reward reading with any other kind of reward than another book. <laughs> they, the, it's, it's kind of um, counterintuitive because it's like a pie eating contest where the the prize is more pie, but that's exactly what you want. You want learning to be its own reward, that humans are very curious and we love learning in general. And when things go off and a kid is not motivated by school, then we have to think, okay, so what is, do we want to do a behavioral intervention here and say, yes, I'm going to reward you just for complying? Um, or do you want them to start to move towards a more intrinsic motivation for learning for learning's sake? And so like, I can't answer that question for you um, because I, you know, sometimes you just need compliance with a teenager, especially when they're going to college and they need to have the grades and all those things. Um, but ideally it would be, you know, why not take this time when there's a little bit less busyness and figure out what else might entice him to do learning activities. So it may not be writing a paper for his, his English class, but what if he starts writing little essays for you about basketball um, to teach you about basketball? A lot of times kids don't, aren't given authentic opportunities to learn or to share their learning because it's so focused on the four walls of the school. And one of the great things about this moment is that kids can now share more widely. Um, so, you know, I think that is a question you can bat around between the two of you, but to me, I would want to know more deeply what is motivating this kid and is there anything that I can get him to engage with? Is there books that he might like to read? Um, you know, just keep trying to pair him with 
good deep questions that'll propel his learning forward and not worry so much about school but you know if you do have to get those grades and those scholarships then I don't know try your money thing and see what happens <laughs> but of course as a teacher I want him to like it <laughs> and I feel like if a kid isn't doing it it's incumbent on the adults in their life to figure out what is the thing that's going to set that kid's hair on fire and make them want to track down an interesting question and learn it for themselves. And that to me is really what education should be doing. So that's what I would hope he would get, <laughs> but certainly pay him if that's what you need to do. <laughs> I appreciate Andrea, I've got to, I've got to leave. Respect. So thank you so much. This was a great, a great session. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye Larry. Bye. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So I know that College Board had talked about if schools were to not open in the fall, SATs would be taken over your computer and they like lock your computer and like go into your camera and your audio. I was wondering <laughs> like if you have thoughts on that and should we be concerned about security and privacy if that were to uh, Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't trust the College Board with my computer. No. Those systems, people do use them. They've been used in colleges for a long time. And so, you know, they're called secure browsers and there's ways to get around cheating. I can't think of a worse idea than forcing everyone to take the SAT and the ACT, but this is like me soapboxing it because I hate those tests. One little sliver of hope though, is that a lot of colleges are saying, you know what? We don't need those tests. And I think, I'd be, I'm really curious to see how this is going to go because I feel like this was something colleges and universities were kind of trending towards because there's absolutely no correlation between your SAT or ACT score and your future achievement in college. There's, what it correlates with is how rich your parents are. Uh, the test is horribly biased and flawed. I'm going to get fired. <laughs> Don't sound this to my employer. <laughs> but I just have a lot of issues with those tests and um, yeah, I, you know, it's a gamble that each individual person has to gauge for themselves. Like as you know, you don't want to cut anyone off from a future opportunity, you know, and like, who am I to talk? I also got a scholarship for my ACT score, you know, back in the day, it was a long time ago. Um, but <laughs> you know, those tests do open up these other doors. So it's always this risk. And I, it's, balancing these different needs and affordances and constraints of each decision and each technology. Um, so we'll see how this all shakes out, but I, I am really cheered up by how many universities and colleges are starting to already come out and say, forget it. We're, we're not going to put a bunch of traumatized children into an already horribly stressful situation, which is these standardized tests, and then think we can draw a single conclusion from it. You can't. Um, so I have real questions about how that's going to shake out. And hopefully it'll be the end of the standardized testing era. <laughs> Did I answer it? <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> I have a question, Andrea. Yeah. So since they're doing the distance learning now through the end of the year, they're probably not going to cover the amount of curriculum that they would have covered if they were in seat right now. So when they go back in the fall, for classes that have a build to them, like I'm moving from foreign language two to foreign language three, or I'm moving from algebra one to algebra two, are they gonna have to rewind and do like a comprehensive review or teach that material for the very first time for some, like what does the fall look like in terms of getting all the curriculum in for next year and making the accommodations for kind of picking up, you know, the second semester of this year? Yeah, so that's one of the things we're working on right now is trying to figure out what that will look like. So think about it, the way that I think about it is if for all of my friends who went to college, um, I loved taking my six week summer courses rather than my three month courses because they were shorter. Um, and our colleges would swear up and down that they were the very same content, just faster, <laughs> right? So um, what? I know about learning is that a lot of times we cover stuff and we're not really thinking about the learners in front of us. Like I'm not covering content. I'm teaching kids, right? Like that's a real shift. 
And I hope that we see more of that shift in conversation when you're talking to teachers and your kids' teachers, because all the kids are going to be in a different place. We've been kind of wondering too, like some kids might get ahead because they're going to have more time to pursue their interests. And other kids, of course, we worry about are maybe going to fall behind because they will not have access in the same way that, um, for instance, my kids who have a certified English and biology teacher and at their kitchen table, <laughs> like I can answer all the questions for them. So, you know, there's a real gap in that. So some of the things we're talking about are online modules that kids might take to sort of catch up in addition. Um, if they need to, they're talking about restructuring the school days. So like people are starting to play around with some real creative ways to try and handle this idea of that we kind of have to get everyone on the same page. Um, but I don't know, I was a foreign language student and there were, there's always a range within a classroom. Some kids just never really get past the beginning in foreign language. Even after four years, they can barely string together sentences. And then other folks are like reading, you know, Freud in German or whatever. There, there's always a range. And so teachers are trained to handle a range of abilities in their classrooms. Um, and I know for English, for example, we're really taught how to remediate when kids are behind on grade levels. Um, so there's lots of ways to tackle that particular issue. Um, and so each content area is going to need to handle that slightly differently depending on what that content and the ways in which that content builds. Uh, so for math, it might be different than it might be in English or science. You know, even in math, you have discrete you know, um, disciplines like trigonometry doesn't necessarily build on geometry. So you can be great in algebra and suck in trigonometry and vice versa. And so some of that will kind of wash out in the end. Um, they won't need to do some of that remediation, even in things that we think might need it, like math. Um, but we forget, people forget stuff um, a lot. It's like, you know, it's back to SAT and ACT. I used to tutor kids in like ACT and SAT math. And the hardest part was trying to remember some of that stuff you did in sixth grade. Like you just forget because you're doing trig now or calc. And it's like, <laughs> I forgot this stuff from sixth grade math, but that's still on there. Um, and it just is a review. So we do a lot of this already is kind of built in. And I think teachers will just have to get a lot more strategic about it. And it's going to look a lot of different ways depending on the context of what the kids are coming with. What we'll probably see is that there will be some kind of diagnostic when kids come back. So by, it might be a more norm reference kind of thing where we're looking at how's your reading level doing? Are you still on grade level for reading? Um, you know, for the littler kids, you know, are you, how are you doing in math? Like your math um, thinking, your computational thinking, that kind of thing. Um, for older kids, it's gonna look different even again, so depending on their age range and grade band and the subject um, will be, probably everybody will do some kind of figuring out where the kids are and then attending to the plans that way. Andrea, this is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this is Mary. Uh, Hi, Mary. Hi, um, I've got a question because my, um, I taught kindergarten for many years. So in yeah. early L, when you are still building, you know, skills, how is, on, how does, I have no clue as to how online learning would, like, say, de continue to develop the year or even any part of, you know, aspects of teaching reading or even, like, the beginning uh, math concepts. So, um, I mean, like, in yours, in the district that you're working with, how are they addressing that? Yeah, so I'm going to actually share my screen again and show you the, um, oh, I have to get post back, Andrew. I can't share. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I was having Andrew help me and then I got confused. Okay. So um, I hope you can see this. It's big enough. But here's the pre K through elementary considerations for how you might go about this. And you can see for kindergarten, uh, we're thinking about. Um, learning activities, outdoor play and exercise, art, music, social, emotional learning, um, career exploration. And so when you get down here, what they're suggesting to the kids is that, or to the teachers who are teaching these kids is that there's a consistent weekly sharing of some kind, that they're trying to get kids connected with books. 
there's online uh, interfaces that are meant for little kids like Seesaw um, and also websites. So I think a lot of the kindergarten age kids, they're kind of being sent out to like go to pbs.org <laughs> and play around with that. Um, our Detroit Public Television is airing grade specific content during the traditional school day and they're adjusting that content to support um, schools so that they can bring that into their plan too. So there's, they're trying to think about like, is there, can you use things around this, the house or around the family to teach some of these concepts and just continue to have kids really being in front of text, um, getting them reading as much as you can or having them read to, um, but you're absolutely right to be worried. Those little kids are not gonna have the same experience um, and, they, and they do have a harder time in these spaces. So um, this is kind of some of the suggestions that we have here um, for the kids when they're little. So it's a lot. This is what we give the teachers as they start to plan. <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's, it's, it's not situation. an easy yeah yeah it i know that the um the teachers are being really creative um in terms of like they're putting their own youtube videos up so the kids can see them and they're calling the kids um trying to you know find out if they're reading and um what they're engaging with in terms of that and sort of just um giving them different inquiry that they can engage with as they move forward. And I also know like our science folks um, around the state have pulled together all of these incredible investigations that you can use with kids with stuff around their house that are really easy for parents to pick up and support. Um, but you're absolutely um, right to worry because as we know, like parents aren't always able to attend to the kids in that way. And um, I know my nephew is three right now. He's almost four. And my sister <laughs> is losing her mind with this three-year-old at home, uh, trying to keep him busy and keep him on track and um, even getting some guidance about what she should be doing with him and like sending her stuff all the time. I think the littler kids, is, it's really gonna be tough. And um, especially when you talk about kids in poverty, um, working in high poverty districts myself, when I have kids coming who don't know the alphabet in kindergarten, they're still kind of getting a handle on that at the end of kindergarten. They're almost already a full year behind when they move into first grade and then the gap will just grow even greater. So I know that those inequities all weigh on us. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, the different uh, online uh, platforms that are being used, do you have any opinions of them like Blackboard or anything like that? There's, I know there's a bunch of stuff that's available. You got any ideas? Do I have my favorites? College or anything? <laughs> no, so I've worked in all of them. Like, I'm not even joking, like Moodle, Desire to Learn, um, uh, Blackboard, you know, Zoom, Google, Google Classroom, like all of them. When One of the things about being in educational technology is that I get a lot of opportunities to sort of dip in and out all of these different products. And really, I just look for commonalities between them. Like, what are they trying to get done? Is there some way to... Um, interact with one another. So like one of, in course management systems, I'm always looking for like, is, is there a way for kids to talk to each other? And can you vary the degrees of how much that interaction happens? Because of course you then always have to worry about bullying and when people aren't following the sort of norms that you want um, in the learning space. But they all are basically have some similar functions as they have some way to organize a lot of content because you're going to have lots of files and links and directions and quizzes and all kinds of stuff. And they have a way to track what your students are doing. And that's really the commonalities among them. Um, and then 
you know, when you get into two-way video chat or there's lots of different text chat um, options for you. And uh, there really are like so many endless possibilities. That's the one thing about the ed tech space for a long time. I, I don't know if I see it as much anymore, but for a long time, people saw it as this sort of cash cow in technology because schools have a lot of money to spend um, that they might be you know used to spend on textbooks. Now they can spend on technology. So a lot of these different um, companies were um, you know, really out in our educational communities trying to sell these products. And for me, I don't really see huge differences between them. So they're all very well, much, pretty you. much the same. I don't have a favorite. Jane has a question. I see her hand raised. <laughs> I you learned did it. I learned how to raise my hand. I'm so proud of you. you. Um, I got on really late because I was at another meeting. Oh, um, you're so busy. Honest to goodness. Um, so I, I'm sorry if, uh, if I'm uh, off topic here, but I'm working on a climate project you'll be shocked to learn. Um, <laughs> and it's called Turn Oakland County Green. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to get information out there and engage people. And my idea was to create some, I wanted to create some activity things for kids to do because I'm mm -hmm. thinking the parents are trying to give the kids educational things to do and if they're working with the kids then I can maybe get the parents attention on the topic too. I don't have any idea. I mean I had kids who went to school but that's <laughs> <laughs> that's all I know. Um, so you know I, I have like that's why I have the idea like I could make some word searches and some Mm -hmm. you know some maps of the county and projects but i'm looking for some a direction on how to create something that might capture some attention well i'm going to give you the trick that every teacher starts with which is somebody out there may have made something already <laughs> that you can adapt or to curate because one of the problems that I know I'm having is people are bombarding i get so many emails a day of like this lesson plan that lesson plan uh, th this set of resources, here's a unit for you over here. And like just scrolling through like the considerations that I just showed up on my screen a minute ago, there it goes on for pages. And that's, those are just the considerations before you start planning for remote learning. You know, right. we have whole degrees devoted to how to do this well. So, um, you know, a nice thing to do is obviously looking around and seeing like, oh, this looks good. Trying it yourself is always my advice too. Like, um, is it maybe something like making a compost bin together or, you know, looking at native plants in uh, yeah. our county or, you know, things like that. Um, probably there's lots of folks in our county already who have played around with some of these ideas. Um, like MSU Extension does stuff, the Oakland County's Farmers Market, they're all putting things out. I mean, even our police department here in West Bloomfield, where I live, they're doing like story time with the, with the police officers every day. Like they're reading to me. Oh, cool. <laughs> like people are creating so much stuff. So like start looking around and see what's out there and then see what is missing. And that's what you create, you know? And then we can just sort of say, hey, parents, if we made this stuff, maybe you find it useful, maybe you don't. Right, but we found all these links for you. We're doing this green, what's it called again? Green, Oakland County? Turn Oakland County, 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 County Green. green. There's Turn a Oakland platform, County. and I was hoping, like, there's a section on transit. Yeah. So can we do something with a map of the county so you could think about, you know, where transit lines ought to be? I don't know. Yeah, I'm well, just... because kids in early elementary study their communities. That's part of right. their content. Um, right. So there's all kinds of mapping activities. Like I know um, the social studies curriculum looks at mapping your community. So you could tap into some of those yeah. existing resources and just say like looking at this right. activity, you know, think about what it would mean if we took this idea of turning Oakland County green and layer that on top of this, like mapping Got our it. neighborhood. Like how, how easy is it, is, is it to walk or get to the grocery store without a car? Like that's a question lots of people can take up. And then what do we do about that? You know, so right. if it's transit. So where would I, are you getting named a couple places? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not even sure what to search, what words to use to search. 
Yeah. So lesson plan pops lesson. up a million things on yeah. writing lesson plans, which yep. no, just like lesson plans and um, Oakland County, just like see who's created stuff already for Oakland County. Um, there might be things. And then MSU extension with the farmer's market does so much stuff with like native um, yeah, plants and all that kind of stuff. So I, I would play around, you know, with what they're putting out and just kind of peek at what they're and doing. Is your session that you just gave us that uh, that's being recorded. So is there a way for me yeah. to access that so I can watch it later? I believe Andrew has the access. We put it up on oh. Facebook after, don't we? Yeah, I think it, they all get posted um, to the BUC okay. YouTube channel and then shared in through Facebook too. Okay. Yeah, and if you get okay. some ideas, Jane, and you want to share them with me, I'll put my um, email again in the chat and you can send them to me and I'll look at them for you. Okay. I can't promise how quick I'll leave because I'm kind of doing a lot right now, but my, I'll my get to them eventually. <laughs> my daughter-in-law is a teacher and I, I was hoping to get her involved and all she did was offer, ask one of her kids' teachers. I'm like, this woman, the teacher's busy. She's <laughs> create a lesson plan for this. I was hoping you'd do it, Marissa, but that didn't work. So it didn't work okay. out yet. Never yeah, mind. Asking people to make lesson plans is a hard ask because um, they take a lot of time. And, and so, I don't, yeah. I don't want to ask someone to yeah. do it. I want to ask for, like you oh. just gave me a little direction, yeah. little direction. And, I'll go off and, yeah. and then if I think of more and as, as I'm noticing what other people are putting out and like the emails that I'm getting that I think might work, but just even noticing like what the libraries are doing, historical societies are putting things out. Nobody's open and they're all looking for things to do. And so they're putting a lot of stuff out online that they never, ever used to do before virtual tool tours of parks in our county um, are going up. So there's just like a lot of options wow. right now. And, and the options that weren't, didn't exist before were harder to find. Um, so it's sort of like this grab bag of a million things that you can go off and play with. Cool. All right. Don't reinvent the wheel. That's right. That's what every, every teacher steals. We all steal from each other. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like remix and redo yeah. and yeah. find something that you think is cool you know, even PBS has like a ton of different activities for parents. Um, and then also the other place you might want to look is Common Sense Media has um, something called Wide Open School that they just launched. And if for my parents out there, if you haven't played around with Common Sense Media is like my favorite nonprofit out there uh, for these kind of questions to the question about like which online system do you like they do reviews done by teachers and by parents and by kids sometimes of all of these different systems they review movies and say like who is this good for like what are the pitfalls of this movie and they rate it on like consumerism and sex and cussing and <laughs> violence and all that kind of stuff so but they have this wide open school right now which has a lot of activities for parents so they can just quickly click on it and filter it and um there might be some inspiration for you there too so that's common cool. sense media's wide open school okay 